Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I am Tony Gerdeman here, as always, with Tom or Tom. How's it going? Tony, the last words you said to me before we hit record were, well, let's see how this goes. So I'm, I'm brimming with optimism. Tony, how are you? Uh, I'm doing better. I'm doing well. Uh, thank you for asking, Tom. That's not like you to uh, concern yourselves with others. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, Tom, I don't know if you've been aware of this. Uh, I'm on the internet, so I am very aware. Things are burning down. The Ohio State recruiting sphere is collapsing as we speak. While we're recording this, we are amidst flames. I am inhaling ash and fumes. I don't know that I'll be able to go more than seven or eight minutes on this show. But I, I would say Rome is burning, but uh, comparing the Ohio State recruiting to Rome, that's that's a lofty comparison. I don't know what was like the fourth best city in Rome's day. Uh, Constantinople, who knows? Um, you know, things, Tom, I'm told are going horribly. Your thoughts? I don't have a coffee mug. I have kind of like a Yeti cup thing. Uh, but I guess I can just hold that and say this is fine. Like I guess I guess that's kind of the correct uh, the correct response there. I, you know, it, I did the morning show with Alex Gleitman for Monday morning, and it was like, well, they got two commitments. They got a defensive back for 2025 out of Georgia. I mean, that's a pretty good poll, and they got their quarterback for 2023. So I, I it must have been a really good recruiting weekend. It was like, well, um. It was an eventful recruiting weekend, if that's, I mean, that's a kind of good, I guess. And it's just, uh, I think tumultuous is a good a good word to describe uh, the current situation around Ohio State recruiting. It's, it's not all bad news. It's not all good news. But it's all been very eventful for the last uh, week or so. So let's discuss the topic of decommitments. Dijon Johnson, cornerback out of Florida has decommitted this had kind of been in the works for a little bit as he started to visit other schools and so he has opened up his recruitment and anytime somebody does this it throws Buckeye fans into um, I don't want to say a tizzy because that would be disrespectful but there's obviously some concern some consternation that goes with it however this happens every year like literally every year Almost every year, a defensive back from Florida will decommit. Nearly every year, a defensive back has decommitted over the last, say, six, seven, eight years. So it's it's one of these things they say, like women with childbirth, they forget the pain of it, so that they aren't, so that they can have more. Like the the pain of decommitments, I think people forget that it happens every year, so that they can be hurt by it again next year, and so that's where we are right now. And you have that. You have some guys that maybe Ohio State was leading for that didn't end up committing to Ohio State. And leading for somebody in June and July doesn't really mean much when you have until December and February to sign. But the the decommitments, and there's, there's rumors and expectations that tight end Ty Lockwood could be decommitting. He was the first commitment in the 2023 class. This is just a way of life. Tom, in recruiting, if you are shooting shooting for the moon on these recruits, sometimes you you hit them, but then you push them into the stars. I'm not sure how that analogy goes, but when you swing big and and you connect on some, eventually other people start swinging for them as well, and then connect even better. To your point, I think this has always been something of an issue when you're recruiting out of region and you're recruiting, especially in the southeast, where. There are a lot of other good programs, rather famously, just ask ESPN. There are a lot of other good programs down in the Southeast, which are closer to home and which some of these guys may feel a little bit of a, you know, you expect a kid from Ohio to go to Ohio State. That's sort of, you know, if you have the option, by and large, that's what they're going to do. So if you have a kid from Georgia or a kid from Tennessee or a kid from Florida, like there are good programs in those states that maybe not Tennessee, but Georgia and Florida, there are good good programs in those states. Alabama, there's good programs in those states. Louisiana, I mean, there's going to be a certain pull to those programs. And I think that's only gotten more unpredictable in the last year or so with the one-time transfer thing, with the NIL piece to all of it. And, you know, this is, I think recruiting has only gotten more difficult and more unpredictable in a lot of ways. 
over the last year. And it's always been a kind of difficult and unpredictable thing. And, you know, I, I think, you know, the, the, you can go down the list and there's a whole bunch of, you know, one-off explanations. And, you know, anytime anyone goes to Alabama, it's like, well, what can you do? They're going to Alabama. And guess what? Alabama's very good. And Nick Saban's very good at what he does. And okay, like you kind of just shrug and go, well, sometimes you're going to lose to Alabama. That's just a thing that happens. And you can go through in the Dijon Johnson situation, really didn't have anything to do with NIL, really didn't have anything to do with, you know, how he'll be developed at Ohio State, that there was like a personal situation involved there that, um, you know, is kind of driving that decision. And that's one of those things where it's like, you know, Ohio State did what they can, and there's some stuff that's just completely out of, out of your control. And... You know, and then you've got, I mean, th there are some weird ones. I mean, the Tackett Curtis, for example, the linebacker out of Louisiana, Ohio State was sort of perceived as the favorite for him for a long, long, long time. And then he ended up going to USC. So that's, you know, and, and is that one completely a done deal? Well, no, not until December or, or February. So we'll see. And then there are other guys who they're still in on. And, you know, I think it's somewhat telling that, uh, you know, the next safety who I think they're kind of in on is Jaden Bonsu. And uh, when I talk to Alex about him, I think Ohio State's feeling somewhat optimistic. I don't think that's a done, done deal, but that's a New Jersey kid. That's not a Florida kid. So, I mean, you're, you're going to end up with, uh, you know, maybe some different concerns there than or different, you know, different uh, factors you know, going into the decision there than with uh, a Florida kid. But, you know, I mean, over the years, Florida, you know, Florida players have a reputation for being unpredictable and being game players and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I don't, the Dijon Johnson thing was, was not that, but you know, that that's kind of the, the cost of doing business in that whole region is you have some game players, you have guys who, you know, there are a lot of programs down there that are willing to, you know, sink some resources into uh, having very, very good football pro uh, programs. And so sometimes you're not going to win all of those. If they start, you know, I think if they start losing a bunch of Ohio players, that I think is a very different conversation than player from the South decided to keep, you know, keep playing football in the South. And and I want to get to some of these names that went elsewhere. But first, I want to stick with the decommitments. Um, it just, Taking out what's going on right now with Dijon Johnson and possibly Ty Lockwood, over the previous nine recruiting cycles, Ohio State has had 35 decommitments. So say four a year, basically. It's just the way of the world. And where are these, where are these four a year coming from? Of those 35 decommitments, nine have come from the state of Florida. If we're including... IMG in that, which had two players decommit from Ohio State. The second most frequent state to decommit from Ohio State is Ohio. And only one of those guys was, was a situation where Ohio State didn't move on. Like, you know, I'm talking Todd Sibley, Danny Clark, George Hill in like 2015, 2016. They moved on from those guys. Devontae Smith, the quarterback from Cincinnati, I think they would have still taken him, but he went on to Alabama. So that gives you an idea of um, what happens in Ohio. But of these 35, 35, 13, or 12 or 13 have come from the SEC's footprint, the Southeast. So when you are you know, swimming in those waters, you're not the only shark there. And there, there's a lot of people there in there. They've three D commitments from the state of Georgia over the years. Um, you know, that's Florida and Georgia have had a dozen decommitments total for the Buckeyes, but you got to keep trying because Ohio State has also had quite a bit of success in Florida and Georgia, and they plan to again in this class as well. You mentioned New Jersey, only one decommitment out of New Jersey in the past decade. Can you name him, Tom? Probably eventually, but it won't make for running very back. good audio on the show. A running back out of New Jersey. Who eventually went he? to Michigan. Oh, Kareem Walker. Yeah, that's right. And that was a situation where Ohio State kind of moved on from him because they were. it was expected for him to decommit. And, you know, what, what's interesting is you kind of go through this list and, you know, as you're naming some of these guys, it's kind of like that didn't really pan out, you know, that, that in a lot of these cases, even the guys who were – Green Walker was at one point when Ohio State, uh, he first committed, was the number one running back in his class and then just kind of 
slowly ticked down the board and, and just didn't, I think, didn't quite develop the way that they thought he might. And then went to Michigan, didn't really do anything, went to, I think, a junior college after that and didn't really do anything. So, you know, that yeah, it's it's interesting that, that I mean, and that's kind of recruiting on the whole. Like, sometimes guys don't pan out. Like, yes, welcome to recruiting. That's <laughs> that's how it goes. And they've had, you know, I, I think they would probably rather have Jordan Battle on this team than not have Jordan Battle on this team. He was a late decommit and uh, ended up flipping to Alabama. And uh, boy, boy, that 2020 Ohio State team could have used Jordan Battle on their sideline instead of Alabama's sideline in that in that national championship game. But, you know, one thing that I think is, you know, if you're looking for something to be optimistic about or feel decent about other than the multiple commitments this weekend, com- decommits now don't kill you. Decommits right before signing day. That's what gets you because then you don't have time to, you know, get to your next plan, your plan B, and bring bring a bunch of guys in in the fall to to have them kind of ready to go. Jordan Battle flipped the day before early signing day, or, you know, it was sort of known that he was going to flip, and then he flipped only on early signing day. Clark Phillips, the cornerback who flipped to Utah, same thing. It was right before early signing day. You didn't necessarily have an opportunity to bring in someone else to fill those slots. And, you know, losing someone over the summer, you know, losing Dijon Johnson now, it's not great. It's not what Ohio State would like, but they have now another four and a half months until early signing day. So, you have time to bring in visitors in the fall, have a little bit, you know, we can talk a little bit about the impact of not having, you know, the, the film to show people right now of this defense, you know, and, and it's all kind of like speculative about how good a Jim Knowles you know, Ohio State defense will be and what a Perry Aliano and Tim Walton defensive backfield will look like. By the time you get to early signing day, it's not speculative anymore. You've got a year of film and, and you know, hey, if this is a top five, top 10 kind of defense, like, well, that might change the conversation for some of these guys a little bit between now and then. It will be interesting to see what kind of impact that will have having that film uh, because you're losing guys. And I say losing guys like the the June 24th official visit day that a bunch of guys come in and I, I think eight of them have already committed to other schools. Caleb Downs, five-star safety to Alabama. Justice Haynes, running back to Alabama. Troy Bowles, linebacker to Georgia. Tackett Curtis, you mentioned, linebacker to USC. John Walker, defensive tackle to uh, Central Florida. Raul Aguirre, linebacker to Miami. Olaus Alinen, uh, offensive lineman to Alabama. And Darren Reed, defensive end to LSU. The the name that sticks out to me in all of this is Tackett Curtis. Uh, you know, Caleb Downs, obviously, Ohio State felt pretty good about him for a while. But when you replace all of your back seven coaches, like you're going to need to prove something to, to recruits. Um, Justice Haynes, you know, I don't, I don't know the situation there. But uh, they, got, they also got Richard Young here in the last couple of days. So... They they're doing Alabama's doing well again at running back. Troy Bowles is a Southeast guy that has you know been tied to Georgia forever. John Walker apparently silently committed to Central Florida three months ago because his family wants him to stay home. Raul Aguirre, another I believe Southeast guy. Um, you know, Olaus Alinen, offensive lineman who Alabama has produced some offensive linemen. Justice Fry, Justin Fry is going to have to prove that he can do this. And Darren Reed, another Southeast guy, staying in the Southeast. The one that sticks out to me, as I said, is Tackett Curtis, because this is one where Jim Knowles had a relationship with him, uh, Oklahoma State. Uh, Tackett Curtis is a Louisiana kid, but not near like any of the the big state school and then they it seemed like everything was trending well for Ohio State. He was on campus. They visited. And then just kind of out of the blue, it's USC. And I, I think that's that's a bit alarming. But, you know, you look at everybody else on this list, and it's almost to a man, it's Southeastern guys staying in the Southeast. It's, it's hard to com- compete with. It's hard to combat. It, you can compete with it. It's hard to combat. It is a, the Tackett Curtis thing for sure is the one that is kind of like the, the, the one that sort of sticks out because if he was going to Alabama, if he was going to LSU, like, okay, that sure. I mean, Louisiana kid goes to LSU. Like that's not really news. 
Ohio State. The last scholarship player Ohio State get out of Louisiana, I think, was Nader Abdallah, I think, which was, what, 15 years ago at this point? I mean, that's that's a long time. 15 years ago, like, he was the end of his career. I think he, uh, he was probably about a 2004 or so recruit. So, yeah, it, I mean, it, it's, it has been a while. That is not typically a place that it's very easy to get players out of. So if you don't get a player out of there, like, okay, you kind of shrug and move on. The existing relationship between uh, Jim Knowles and Tackett Curtis and the fact that Jim Knowles made him such a priority coming in, that's like, okay, th- th- that's a little bit of a concern, I think. And, you know, you, you're going to have, you are going to have the John Walker sometimes where the family really wants him to stay close to home. So he's going to stay close to home and, you know, Florida and Ohio are not that close. And there are other schools that play football in Florida. And, you know, if, if you were making a purely football decision, I don't think there's a real compelling argument to choose UCF over Ohio State. But sometimes the, there are other factors that go into this. This is the B. John Robertson, Robinson conversation where, you know, he was all set to commit to Ohio State. And then his grandparents wanted him to stay a little closer to home in Arizona. And so he went to Texas instead. And so, you know, there's a certain point where it's like, well, y- you have made your case and there's only so much you can do. And, you know, you... <laughs> Yeah, yes, yes, California is Big Ten country now, but also it's, you know, it still is a uh, quite a long, quite a long plane ride from one place to another. And it's hard to go see your see your kid play every weekend if if you have to get on a plane every single weekend to go see him play. So that's, you know, th- there's only so much you can do in certain circumstances. But yeah, the, the tack at Curtis one definitely does stand out that, you know, it, it felt like Troy Bowles always felt like it was, you know, for the last six months it has felt like Ohio State was trying to come from behind with Troy Bowles and, and it was likely to end up in Georgia. So that one, you know, that one you kind of go, well, you know, they had a they had a puncher's chance and they didn't get, didn't get it, so it's okay. Tackett Curtis for a long time felt like he, you know, Ohio State was the lead there. And I don't know that I've heard a particularly satisfactory answer on, yeah, they just sort of threw the bag at him in terms of NIL or, you know, some other factor came into it. And, you know, sometimes you get these wild things where, uh, uh, Derek Morris is uh, Derek Morris's dad wants to have a rap career, so he's going to go to Miami and set. Sean like, Trell I mean, Henderson. Sean Trell Henderson. That's right. That's right. Sorry. Yes, I, I was make, I was confusing my two uh, thousands offensive lineman. Yes, Sean Trell Henderson's dad wants to have a rap career, and so he's going to go to Miami because he's going to get his record produced there or something. Like some, sometimes there's stuff that's just like you you sort of shrug your shoulders and go, yeah, man, it's recruiting, whatever. But. Uh, yeah, the, the, the Tackett Curtis one, of all of these, the Tackett Curtis one is the kind of one that jumps out to me and I just kind of go, hmm, that's, you know, I don't, I don't know, I don't know if concerning is the right word, but it's just kind of like, yeah, that one, that one just kind of stands out. I think it's a tremendous lesson for Jim Knowles on what it is now like to recruit at a place like Ohio State or USC or Alabama or Georgia, where you don't just rely on like, well, things are good in June. Think, you know, like this, this has to be until they are signed, you are recruiting that person because everybody else is recruiting, trying to catch up with you, trying to surpass you. And it's no different than any other competition. You know, like uh, somebody out there is working harder than you are. Like somebody out there is recruiting harder than you are. And he got, he got, a, got a good taste of that and, and what it requires. And it's definitely different than recruiting at other places he's been where you kind of just hope other schools don't come in late and grab your guy. Like you've seen this guy, you, you know, you, you have to recruit under the radar kids. And then he blows up as a senior. And instead of going to Oklahoma state, he's going to you know, Oklahoma or Texas. Whereas now, like all of these guys are above the radar. Everybody knows about them. And it's, it's just a constant battle every single day to bring these guys in. And now he knows it. And, uh, you know, he, it's same with Justin Fry, who has not had to deal with this kind of thing at UCLA because you're just, you know, like it's for one, it's more laid back in terms of California, in terms of Chip Kelly style, in terms of, well, we know we're not going to get the five stars. Let's, you know, let, let's, let's know our role. Let's know our level and let's just hang out there at Ohio State. Like you can go to higher levels, but if you do, you better be wor- working and working and working because everybody else is. And so it's, they, they're, they're going to be running into different kinds of um, you know, opponents on the field and off the field. And so I think this was, it's better to get it out of the way, as you said, in June and July and August than for them to be like, 
thinking they have everything wrapped up and in December they lose all of their top guys and that you're you're left scrambling. So there there are any blessings here for Ohio State and for these two new coaches and and Perry Aliano and Tim Walton. It's that this stuff is happening now. And now they have an opportunity this season to show these kids that they have made the incorrect choice. And I, I, I don't know how many of these guys will come back into the fold, but you, you move on, Tom, and you know, you reassess your board and go from there. Yeah, and you know, I think this is this is a group of people who are fishing in it. You know, you're used to fishing in the pond in your backyard. That's that's recruiting at UCLA. I mean, UCLA. Chip Kelly rather famously is, you know, Alabama will throw out, you know, hundreds of offers or, you know, air quotes, offers every cycle. There were cycles where Chip Kelly was offering like 60 kids, like just just not being very, very selective. And an offer was an offer and it would really mean something different. And, you know, UCLA, you don't usually see UCLA and Alabama as the two hats on the table, put it that way. So, you know, you, you're kind of you, you've gone from fishing in your your own little back backyard pond and, and now you're fishing either uh, in, you know, in Lake Erie or you're fishing in the ocean and you're, you know, you're trying to reel in sharks and it's like, oh boy, this is a little bit different. And then you're also going against schools that are, I mean, there are some schools that are fishing with dynamite right now too. And that kind of changes the equation as well. So there's just, you know, I think there's going to be a little bit of an adjustment and, and between that and between not necessarily having the, uh, you know, UCLA is not churning out Outland Award winners, uh, you know, probably since Jonathan Ogden. So it's, it has been a hot minute for UCLA churning out Outland Award winners, uh, you know, and, and you know, Perry Eliano can point to some recent successes at, at Cincinnati, and Jim Knowles can point to some statistical stuff at, at Oklahoma State, but it's still not, you know, you're not seeing a bunch of top five draft picks coming out of Oklahoma State. So there's just, there's going to be a little bit of a curve. And if Paris Johnson wins the Outland Award this year, well, that might change the conversation around Justin Fry a little bit. And that's not, you know, that's not out of the realm of possibility or winning the Joe Moore Award for the top offensive lineman of, of, you know, a top offensive line in the country. Like, okay, that probably changes the conversation there a little bit. Or if the Ohio State defense goes from giving up whatever they gave up last year, 17, 20 points a game, whatever it was, to, you know, okay, well, now they're giving up 13 points a game and they're, you know, they're, they're shutting teams out and oh boy, they're statistically dominant and oh boy, look at JT Tui Molowau and Zach Harrison and Jack Sawyer and Denzel Burke is going to, you know, a finalist for the Thorpe Award. Like that, this all changed the conversation very quickly. Does it change the conversation quickly enough to impact the 2023 class? Maybe, maybe not, maybe in some circumstances, but it probably does for 2024. And, you know, you look at the 2023 class and there's still I have not looked at the updated ratings since Dijon Johnson decommitted, but they were, you know, even after all of these other guys had, had, uh, they're still, okay, they're still second. Yeah. So even after all these guys have, de- have, you know, they've missed on these guys and guys have decommitted and, and okay, well, they've, they've tumbled all the way to second in the country. Like if, if you have a top five class, you have a top five class and, you know, yes, the wide receiver unit is doing a lot of the lifting there. And, but you know, this has been a, this is a good offensive line class already. They probably need another tackle but is a good offensive line class already. Are, are you telling me you're betting against Larry Johnson bringing in a pretty good defensive line class? I would not bet against Larry Johnson bringing in a pretty good defensive line class. So, okay, they got to figure out linebacker. You're probably getting Arvell Reese out of Glenville, so that's one. And then, you know, can you find another linebacker that you're happy with? Okay, and then find a corner, bring in another safety or two. And you know, this is this is, you know, going to be at least a very good class, and it has the opportunity to be a great class. So... I think you know the 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 last two weeks or so has not been very good for Ohio State in terms of recruiting. But this is not a two week you know this is not a two week sprint. This is they had a very, you know a really outstanding class and they've hit a rough patch here and then they have plenty of time to potentially correct and get back on track and finish with a you know number two number three kind of class again. And that's that's well within the uh, realm of possibility here and. So yeah, I would not uh, I would not panic just yet. Not you know things things are not great, but also I would not panic just yet. Well, and it's been overall a productive month of July, and that's not including landing uh, commitments on you know, from Kay and Lee on June twenty seventh, and Calvin Simpson Hunt on June thirtieth. You know, two top twenty corners, but in July you had you know first, lastly, most recently they got their quarterback Brock Glenn. So, you know, four-star quarterback out of Tennessee. 
you get that position taken care of. They, they were concerned about that. They finally got their guy, and it's not easy to sandwich a quarterback into the 2023 class when you've got the number 122 guy and the number 12024 guy, but they've gotten that taken care of. You also had this month Jermaine Matthews after camping at Ohio State, after camping at LSU, blowing up nationally. They got his commitment on July 1st. You have Jelani Thurman, the tight end, committing a couple of weeks ago, the number seven tight end, the number 106 player nationally, ranked higher than Ty Lockwood, uh, a unique athlete at that position. Now, of course, I believe he's already visited Auburn, so there may be some some hoping and holding on there. But earlier, three weeks ago, Jason Moore, top 50 kind of defensive end out of um, out of Maryland. So it's been, and then, you know, the, a week before the start of Ju- July, you had Brandon Innes and Noah Rogers committing. So, like, it's been an eventful six weeks overall. It's been a positive six weeks. And even looking now, 19 guys in the class, nine of them are from the SEC footprint. And that doesn't include a Texas kid and a North Carolina kid. So even though they're missing out on some of these guys from the Southeast, they are still connecting on enough. And Ohio State will continue to do that because you have to get the best from all around the nation. And they can go all around the nation, and they will never stop going into the Southeast. Yeah, this is just this is a class that I think is, you know, on track to be a very solid Ohio State class. You are not going to have the single greatest recruiting class in college football history every single year. That's just not how it works. And there have been years where Ohio State has, at this point in the cycle, you're you're looking and you run through the class calculator and it's like, well, they're in on these six guys. And if they get five of these six guys, it will be the highest ranked class in the history of college football. And then the way it works is you get two of those six guys or three of those six guys or whatever, you know, whatever the number ends up being. And you end up with a very good class. If you have a class, this is not, I don't think this is going to be a class where they end up at, you know, with some massive number of kids. If you end up with, you know, a top five class where your average player ranking is, you know, your, your overall class ranking is top five and your, your average player ranking is top five and you have a reasonable distribution of, You've got, you know, you're not, you don't have one offensive lineman in the class. You've got a well-rounded class where you hit your, can I hit your numbers at each position group? That's good enough to get you into the college football playoff and potentially win the national championship. This is, this is, you know, I think everyone feels like right now that this is a disaster and the roof is falling in. And it's like, it, it, this has not been the greatest two weeks in Ohio State recruiting history, but it also, they're still number two in the cl- in the nation. They're not number two in the nation because they have 37 kids committed. They have, you know, essentially the same number of kids committed as this is, you know, earlier in the cycle, Texas Tech was top five because they had like 24 players committed already and everyone else had 12. Well, Texas Tech is not top five anymore. So, you know, Ohio State is top five because they have a good size class, a very good core of the class. They have good quality players in the class. And, you know, this is this is not a class that's filled with projects or reaches or anything like this. This is this is, I think, a, a very good, solid class. And you got another four and a half months to kind of fill the fill the few vacant spots and and uh finish strong and and end up with another top 5 class and if they do that's you know you're 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 going to be top class of the Big 10 you're going to continue to have the best players in the Big 10 you're going to continue to have college football playoff and you know potential national championship uh, caliber talent on the team and so you know you can you can panic over that if you want to but it's probably it's probably a little early and probably a little unnecessary to be doing that it's much more important to have production than a high recruiting ranking. Look at the 2018 class. They also finished second in the nation, but we're still waiting on the bulk of that class to really do something. And this is their last chance this season. Just um, so yeah, rankings are obviously what you shoot for because you know, it, it, it works out for the most part. What you said was interesting though. Like a lot of times you have uh, Ohio State has all of these guys that they're still in on. And it's like, if this guy and this guy and this guy, then, you know, they'll, they'll have the top class in the nation. They never finish with all of those guys and they finish somewhere in the top two, three, four. Ryan Day said the expectation every year, they want to have a top five class. If they're, they're at two right now and there aren't as many of those, if this guy, then this guy and, and this guy, then they're going to have this. Um, I think top five might be difficult because this is also where, Alabama comes up from behind. Texas A&M comes up from behind. Florida is trending right now, so they may may fall out of that top five. Um, 
I'd say through no fault of their own, but I guess, you know, it, it's always their own fault. You know, let's, let's not, uh, you know, sugarcoat this. They're, they're screwing up bigly, but it, it's just, you know, when you, um, when you miss on some guys early, then you have to do the fallback and it, I don't know if it's going to be a top five class. That's just, that's just over the years of seeing how they invariably fall back a little as the SEC kicks it in towards signing day. And it won't surprise me if that happens again. And there may be like a six, seven, eighth ranked class this year, but, but we shall see Tom, anything else? Firstly, Tom, before I get to you, if you're watching this on YouTube, Please uh, hit, hit the bell, subscribe, hit the bell, get notified when we uh, when we drop videos. Uh, leave some comments; that helps us as well. But uh, if you can subscribe to the YouTube channel, as we are now at our new home, Buckeye Huddle site launch, full site launch yet to be determined, but very very soon. Camp opens for the Buckeyes on the fourth, which is Thursday. All kinds of good stuff going on right now involving us, which is the most important thing. But, uh, Tom, uh, anything else before we go? And would you like to plug your morning show? Yeah, you can find the new morning show, which is going to remind you probably a lot of the old morning show. You can find that at Buckeyes Tomorrow Morning on your podcast platform. Wherever you're listening to this on your podcast platform, just search Buckeyes Tomorrow Morning. You can subscribe right there. Uh, leave a five-star rating and review as well, which will kind of help us move up the algorithm as we rebuild our audience from zero there. Uh, that will be tremendously helpful. And uh, you can also find the Buckeyes Tomorrow Morning podcast right where you're listening to this same channel on YouTube. You can, uh, again, as you're watching those, hit the thumbs up button, leave us a comment. That's always super, super helpful in terms of the YouTube algorithm. And then uh, hit the bell that will subscribe you to our channel, get you notified every time we post a new video. So you get all those, all those Buckeye Tomorrow Morning episodes, all those Buckeye Weekly episodes, all the other great stuff that we've got uh, coming on that channel. That's all uh, same YouTube channel as you're watching this on now. Same uh, podcast platforms you're listening to this on now, uh, and it's just Buckeyes tomorrow morning. So we really appreciate your support there, and uh, will help us uh, build our audience up pretty quickly as we head into football season. Yes, absolutely. So that will do it for this episode. Want to thank you all for stopping by and get ready. Fall camp is almost here. So that will do it for today. Thank you all, and we will talk to you guys later. <laughs>